It's, it's always a pleasure when uh, a less gray-headed figure stands at the podium because we all are about the future with due reverence to the past. We are looking ahead. It is all about what will come to our children, our children's children, what we can do to save Dixie for them. By the way, if anyone wants to take a look at the kids that I and my wife and I are adopting, I do have photos with me, should you be so interested. And yes, they do sing Dixie every night. I'm very pleased to welcome to the podium our first speaker to begin the conference, Mr. Josh Doggerel. He lives in the town of Sachs in Calhoun, uh, in, 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 which is part of Anniston, Alabama, Calhoun County. He's the chairman of the John C. Calhoun chapter of the Alabama League of the South and has been since its inception in the year of our Lord 2009. He himself has been a member of the League since 1995. He may have even gotten there before I did. When he joined after meeting Dr. Hill, when he was a student at the University of Alabama. And while there, he served as Secretary, Vice Chairman, and Chairman of the University of Alabama chapter of the League. He's been employed as a peace officer. How often do we hear that word, ladies and gentlemen? Peace officer. I hear all about law enforcement, special tactics and this command and that command and various paramilitary attributions, but a peace officer? What a positively antique and quaint term. He's been a peace officer in his home city and county for 16 years. He's married to the former April Bonner for the past eight years and they have three children together. Tyler, age eight, Nathaniel, age five, and Shiloh, age two. What good name. His talk today is entitled, Cultivating the Goodwill of Peace Officers. Please join me in a big League of the South welcome for Mr. Josh Dogger. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am thrilled to be here. Um, I remember saying that last year too, but this is a highlight of my year, to be sure. And I'm also happy to be going first. The great thing about going first is I don't follow anybody. And I would hate to have to follow Pastor Weaver. And so no matter how bad things get up here, please just bear with me, grit your teeth, and say, get through this through this jack leg up here and Pastor Weaver will be will be following us. So, uh, I am happy to be here. Um, it, it is again a thrill of mine to be here. Uh, speaking of Pastor Weaver, I have had the, the uh, honor and privilege of spending time with him in some several of the Georgia State conferences uh, with Ed, Ed Wolf and Wendell and those folks who do a fantastic job uh, of organizing things over in Georgia. One time Pastor Weaver and I were staying at the the same hotel and had breakfast together before one of those conferences. The next week, I went back to my department and we get the very aptly misnamed intelligence report from the SPLC. So we were <laughs> leaping through that and I said, hey, I had breakfast with that guy just the other day. <laughs> it's always wonderful to go by there and, and show my bosses all the radicals that I cohort with on the weekends. At uh, another, another uh, Went to a Georgia summer school in 2009, and uh, Clive Wilson was there, and uh, another another guy who, who, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to or read, um, fantastic. Uh, see, I get to be I get to be around my heroes. It, it, it would, it's almost like if this was 1776 and you had Thomas Jefferson sitting next to you. This this is what this is like for me. That's why I get such a thrill out of it. So Dr. Wilson is speaking at this summer school I'm at. I'm on the front row. My buddy Jody LaRue is to my right. There's an empty seat to my left. And who comes in and sits next to me but Clive Wilson. And I always carry around something to read with me in case I ever, ever get to where I uh, have an idle time. I hate idle time. And I had a Chronicles magazine. And if you, if you don't subscribe to Chronicles magazine, you really should. It's a fantastic publication. But... Uh, 
on the back of it, there was an advertisement for a school they had coming up in North Carolina or somewhere. And there it is, Dr. Wilson's picture on the back of this magazine. So I, looking down at my magazine, I looked to my left, I nudged Jody. The guy on my magazine sitting next to him, how cool is that? I mean, we were, <laughs> you, you don't get that kind of thing. Um, so, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be around sanity. As I said last year, I, I trounce around in the wilderness among people who think differently than I do and I don't understand. It's good to be among people who think like I do for a change, even if it's sure just a weekend. And we're, we're working on getting more of those people around to our way of thinking. He mentioned that I've been a peace officer for 16 years, and I do prefer that term. Uh, enforcing the law is something that we wind up having to do as a result of doing our duty, but it shouldn't be our main area of focus. Um, when my son, Tyler, who's here, asked me years ago when he was wanting to know what it was that I did when I went to work, I told him, trying to explain it to a four-year-old, I go to help people, and that's what we should be about. If that means sometimes putting a criminal in jail, so be it, but there are times when we render services to the public. We are public servants. We are accountable to the public, and true enough, too many peace officers lose sight of that. Now, it's not easy being a League of the South member either. One of the things I know when I come and be among you folks is that nobody is here for personal glory because there's I hope, and I hope we get to that day one day too. I hope we go and we go, you know, that guy's just here because the League of the South is so dang popular and he's just trying to ride our coattails. I hope, I hope we get to that day. But I know that's not the case with you folks here. It can be hard. And let me tell you, uh, we had um, a city councilman who could be best described as a small town Jesse Jackson. And when we, we uh, began our chapter in 2009, and um, there was an internal investigation launched against this cop who had founded a local hate group. And I was cleared of that and <laughs> hopefully won't have to put up with that again. And that city councilman, by the way, has been voted out of office as well. Yes. So there are, in my department, has been very supportive of me. I, I've somehow been promoted twice since I've been there. So these folks are not necessarily always against us. I hope I, I, want, I want to leave you with that impression. Um, there is an impression, and, and it's true, we'll get into some of that, about the infiltration of the national government into local police power. It's a problem. But that doesn't mean that every cop is, on, is against you or, or, or not against us and not on our side. I've been, um, as Mr. Cheek said, a member for, for 18 years. That, I'm 36 this year, so that makes it half my life. Anybody else can say they've been a member of the League of South for half their life? It's Nathan Horton. I don't know, he's probably close. <laughs> there, is one, yeah, be close. there is one other person that I know, and that's my daughter Shiloh. She's two, and she's been a member for a year. <laughs> It is true that I made her a member. Um, I'm, I, a father can do that, you know. I make my children go to church, and, they, and if you're going to live under my roof, you're going to have a time to be home, you're going to follow rules, you're going to go to church, and you're going to be a leave of South Man. That, that's just the way it is. If you, you get to be 18 and choose to do something else, I haven't raised you right, but I, that, then it will be your decision. Um, been a peace officer for 16. Let me tell you the a little story about the, the National Conference seven years ago. I don't remember, I'm sure some, several of you were there. In Chattanooga, uh, one of the speakers was Reverend Eugene Case. And the title of his speech was Whatever Happened to Officer Friendly? I remember sitting in the seat out there looking at this program and thinking to myself, oh boy, here we go. I braced my shoulders for this attack uh, and he, for about 45 minutes of not quite torture, laid out a very well-reasoned critique of the things that are wrong with local police power. Now, at the end of it, I found myself relieved 
that it was over, but I also found myself standing up with everybody else and clapping because with almost no exception, he had not said anything that I didn't concur with and things that I had tried to, to bring out and make known myself after a while. So whatever did happen to Officer Kremlin, when did peace officers come primarily law enforcers? Problems have been laid out with this and the criticisms, as I've said, some of them are very relevant. But it's not some kind of wholesale corruption. It would be very hard to be. There are between 12 and 13,000 police departments in the United States. That is not including sheriff's offices. Now, they're not as independent as they should be or regrettably as they used to be, but they still can operate quite on an autonomous sphere in relation to each other, even within their own county. Let me give you an example of my home county, Calhoun, named after John C. Calhoun, by the way, I was like that. Uh, Calhoun County has several different police agencies. I, I work in Anniston, which I'll go ahead and go on record. Uh, nothing I say here today is necessarily the views of the Anniston Police Department. I speak only as an individual and non-employee of that agency. But Anniston is the largest seat. The sheriff of our county is a scoundrel named Larry Amerson. And I used to work at the sheriff's office. And what, uh, whenever anybody asks why I left the sheriff's office, it's very easy, Larry Amerson. Uh, he's, he's the type that needs to be out of law enforcement and the out of police power. Uh, but he won election in 1994, and as I talked with Caleb Horton last night, it's hard to get a sitting sheriff out of power, isn't it? All right, no matter what, no matter how good or bad he may be. Well, Larry won office in 1994. He has won re-election four times. Nobody even bothered to run against him last time. But two of those times, his chief competitor was the police chief of Aniston. Needless to say, these two men do not like each other. <laughs> and as, uh, as popular as Larry can be with some people who live out in the, in the county who don't really understand what all is going on down at 400 West 8th Street in Aniston, um, he is quite unpopular in the police community. Uh, so much so that in 2006, when a very young and up-and-coming police officer ran against him, the Aniston Lodge of the Fraternal Order of Police actually endorsed the opponent, which is pretty rare and is even more surprising when it was pretty obvious that he had little chance of winning. Um, so again, I say all that to say, these agencies are not working lockstep with each other to coerce, be corrupt, or, or oppress their citizens. Uh, they can't even get along with each other. So, uh, the status of our sheriff is regrettable. Let me tell you another thing about him. He is the head, the president of the Alabama Sheriff's Association. This is a very political group. Give you an idea about how this group operates. This past winter, he headed a delegation that went up to Washington and sat down, I called them fireside chats, sat down with President Obama and Vice President Biden to discuss the gun proposals that came out in the wake of Sandy Hook. And while President Obama gave lip service to the Second Amendment, like he, and that's all it is, uh, he usually does, the Alabama Sheriff's Association wound up endorsing his executive orders. This has been very, unpopular with the police community in Calhoun County and uh, I would feel comfortable saying in the entire state of Alabama. Uh, one of the things that um, is so important, particularly about a sheriff, is the vast amount of power that I know that our, in our state, and I think most other states are like this, that invests in the position of sheriff. It is an extremely important position, wide range of authority, and I've heard League of the South members before, and Franklin Sanders in particular, talk about the importance, and he called it the most important civil elected position that we can have. There are other sheriffs that demonstrate a different type of attitude towards these gun proposals. For example, Lynn County, Oregon, Sheriff Tim Mueller 
wrote a letter to Vice President Biden after these proposals. Let me quote this excerpt. Any federal regulation enacted by Congress or by executive order of the President offending the constitutional rights of my citizens shall not be enforced by me or my deputies, nor will I permit the enforcement of any unconstitutional regulations or orders by federal officers within the borders of Lynn County, Oregon. A little closer to home, Madison County, Alabama, which is just a little bit up the road from us, it seats Huntsville. And uh, like a normal county that has a city like that, you know, you got NASA and Huntsville, you got a lot of federal employees in Huntsville, but the rest of it is fairly rural. But their sheriff's name is Blake Dorning. And he made it clear too, that he was going to serve as what he should be, an interposition. The sheriff of a county should be an interposition between his county citizens and any kind of aggression on either the state or the national level. He's invested with that power and too many sheriffs shirk that responsibility. I don't think Blake Dorning, if we can at least judge by his words, is going to do or be like that. This was his statement about the executive orders. Quote, the federal authorities can try to enforce it. I'm the sheriff of Madison County. I took a constitutional oath to defend the Constitution of the United States and to defend the Constitution of the state of Alabama, even if it takes my life. That is my position. And he went on to say, quote, our people in our communities and homes need not fear that the sheriff of Madison County or his deputies would come to their homes and attempt to disarm them. It will not happen under my watch. Spartanburg County, South Carolina, Sheriff Chuck Wright had this to say about Obama's proposals. Quote, I'm not going to confiscate weapons from people that are law-abiding citizens. I'm not doing it, and I don't care what kind of orders come down. Excellent. We need more sheriffs like that. Amen. There is, without a doubt, a fierce spirit of resistance throughout what we call the red states. Uh, that old Jeffersonian, Jacksonian alliance between the South and the West. Um, potential allies out there too, to the South. This is certainly uh, people in states such as Montana, Wyoming. These are people who, who think like we do in regards to not only the Second Amendment and gun rights, but on limited and constitutional uh, government. We can band together, we can do things, and the sheriffs can be the teeth in this resistance. Again, that the old word of interposition is something that has to be revived when we talk about elected officials such as a sheriff standing between us and being our interposition and our guard between this kind of aggression. We still have a way to go because many of the sheriffs and other lawmen um, will protest, but allow their protests to be heard in the national court system. Uh, when Obama was reelected last year, it revived secession talk, remember that. Uh, and I'm always happy to hear secession talk. I think it's a positive no matter what. But we know, as Southern Nationalists, the folly of the online petition where the, you petition for secession from the very entity you're wishing to withdraw from. That's ridiculous. Free men do not ask permission for independence. Amen. They just leave. Amen. The entity you are combating should not be the arbiter of the issue. This shouldn't go before the Supreme Court. This is not a matter for Congress. This is a matter for us through our state legislatures, just like we've done before. Amen. We need that spirit. We need the revival of it, nullification, interposition, secession, and independence in local and state governments. Nowhere is that more needed than in state police power. And within that community, the county sheriffs are instrumental in their role. Uh, for the sake of time, I would suggest when you were surfing on the internet, go to countysheriffproject.org countysheriffproject.org their stated goal on the website is to quote serve as a platform to assist the people and strategic alliance partners alike 
and our mutual goals of peacefully ending state and federal tyranny. Here's a question a lot of people have. If it came down to it, would local peace officers follow dictates from D.C. and disarm their own citizenry? Would Southern lawmen turn their guns on their fellow Southerners in an attempt to carry out unlawful orders? Speaking on the authority of a local peace officer and an Alabamian, I can say without equivocation that the overwhelming majority of them would not. Now, are there local peace officers that are consumed with nationalism? Are there many that are beholden to the federal team? Are there many that are confused about what their role as a law officer and protector of citizens' rights is? Absolutely. However, I do believe this makes up a substantial minority of that community, and it makes that community no different than any other Southern community, actually. The vast majority of men in uniform are aware that they're Southerners and kith and kin comes before illegal national mandates. <coughs> you may ask how many police officers I've recruited to the league. Well, I'm not many. But I've not been able to recruit a whole bunch of people anyway to the league. But uh, I do run in those circles. I've had people. Uh, again, been, been in the Southern Nationalist Movement a long time, been called all the names that y'all have, crazy, um, the eye rollers I call them, you know. You start talking to them, they can see their eye, oh, that will never happen. Uh, but continuously, but Dr. Hill said last night in, when at the, our state meeting, it is a grind. If you're not prepared for that, you're going to be very disappointed. And we all can fight despondency anyway. I would love to, to jerk people to our, over to our cause. Okay, but that's, that's generally not human nature and it's not successful. It's a grind. But I will say this, some of those same people who say 10 years ago were telling me how crazy I was, this week are telling me I am this close to where you're at. Okay? We've got to keep working on that and stay the course. But the people that do the job of a peace officer, if they're good at it, if they're in it for the right intentions, are usually pretty virtuous people. Public servants, keepers of the peace. We work the homicides that are out there. We respond to the robberies. We patrol closed businesses. We keep an eye on open businesses. We serve as deterrents in high crime areas. We guard inmates and assure their presence at court. We serve as security at those court proceedings. We answer the calls for service no matter where they are or who they were from because someone has to in order to maintain a civil society. We arrest sex offenders, perpetrators of assault, facilitate prosecution in the criminal justice system. We honor patrol requests. We unlock car doors. We give courtesy rides. We drive by during bank deposits. In a nutshell, like I said, we do things to try to help people. Isn't this the kind of people that we would want in our organization and in our independence movement? September of 2009, the Southern National Congress convened and adopted what they called a resolution and appeal to law enforcement in the Southern states. It begins with this sentence. The Southern people have traditionally been strong supporters of the rule of law, properly founded upon impartial justice. We understand the need for a civil government. We're not anarchists. Now, believers in limited govern government are not believers in no government at all, but we do believe in the right and the consent of the governed. Uh, I talked about other southern communities and people that uh, we take issue with and, so, and how far we've got to go. This past fall, my family and I had a very hard decision when we left the church we were going to for eight years. And I tell you, there were several issues, but a main one was our that church, just like so many of the evangelicals, has become absolutely eaten up with nationalism. It had already gotten to the point where we couldn't go on national holidays anymore because it'd be turned into just a big pep rally. And I swear to God, I thought at any moment somebody was gonna grab that flag and start running around with it. As, 
Um, I didn't want to be there. I probably didn't want to trip that person. <laughs> but they have seen the battle hymn of the Republic in that uh, church, and I have got out and walked out. But the, I guess the final straw, if you would, is the, the last service I attended was the Sunday before the election, the national election, um, where our pastor did a presentation on citizenship. Mm. And he trotted out that old verse from Romans about being obedient to civil government and that it's ordained by God. And at one point, walked over, and yes, there's a U.S. flag on the stage, of course. Gra grabs the flag and says, what God is saying is, if you're disobedient to this, you're disobedient to God. Amen. At that point, I realized, time to go. Time to go. Uh, we, and of course, the joy of being in the South is we have so many churches to choose from. I mean, yeah. we, are, we, absolutely, we pass our old church on the way to the new one, and it's about a half a mile up the road. And I can thankfully say there is no U.S. flag anywhere on the grounds or inside the church. Okay. So... That's, that was all I needed to, to start with, and uh, we're, we're happy there. But uh, I did send him a, a message. You know, I always try to work things out. I like, I, I love the man. He, he, he's been good to our family. Uh, we just disagree on this. But I sent him a message that said, because I'm sure y'all get that, right? Roman says we're supposed to be obedient. So, so, so I sent him a message, and I'm paraphrasing from memory here, but I said, I agree that God ordains civil government. What I don't agree is that we can't choose which one that we're obedient to or follow the rules of. Carrying that logic out, what would keep the people of Nazi Germany from being against the government of Hitler? What would keep the Soviet Union from being against the government of Joseph Stalin? What would keep the Iraq of Saddam Hussein uh, from not being, from the people being obedient to it? Or the people, the, the colonists from being obedient to the Government of King George. I got no response from that from that message, which again told me time to go. Um, we understand the need for a civil government. So when somebody tries to trot out that old Romans argument with me, the God did not ordain the United States government and say we had to be beholden to it, just like He didn't say that we had to be beholden to the government of King George the Third. Now. We draw the line when order comes at the expense of liberty. Like many governmental issues, law enforcement and peacekeeping are powers that must be checked. They must be restrained and the proper balance must be kept between order and liberty. Your everyday peace officer is granted one of the most awesome powers that can be granted to any individual and that's the power to take someone else's liberty away. Truly enough, too many of them are too cavalier about that power. Now, talking about the particular type of person that makes up, and I always, I always preclude this, a good and successful peace officer, because we've got many bad and unsuccessful ones, just like any other line of work, right? What makes up the, the good and successful peace officer makes them a little different than most of your other ordinary citizens. Dr. Hill talked last night again about the warrior mentality, and I think he's gonna talk some more about that. Well, we've got to become warriors in this movement, which again, as he said, starts here and here. But we're talking about peace officers. They don't, I don't wanna compare them to soldiers in combat. Don't get me wrong, it's nothing like that. We don't face a crisis every day, but we do, wind up facing things that are different. <coughs> um, we're normally skilled in the use of firearms, which we need, trained, tactically sound, have a penchant for facing danger, and most have the grit, fortitude, and thick skin necessary to mount these uphill challenges. Compared to the average citizen, we see disproportionate evil, we see a high number of dead bodies, murdered and assaulted people, broken families, domestic disputes, burglarized homes. We're in charge of arresting, incarcerating, and keeping them incarcerated, people who have committed heinous acts against their fellow citizens. There's plenty of them out there, folks. In this way, we serve security and facilitate the criminal justice system. In March of 2003, 
I had to respond to a call where one of my very best friends and a coworker had to take the life of an armed criminal who pulled a gun on him. And that was a, something that's difficult to go through. I'm happy to say that that man remains a very good friend of mine today, and he's the vice chairman of that chapter. He's sitting right there, Jody LaRue. And then on the 24th of August, 2011, one of our officers at Anniston called out on a foot pursuit of a criminal. I was six blocks south of it. We lost radio contact with him, and several of us found him one block south of where he was in a church parking lot with a bullet in his head. We tried to perform CPR on him, and we watched him die waiting on the medics to get there. Later that day, we had to go out and hunt down this guy that did it and bring him in. Then we had to sit there and question this guy about what he did. These things are difficult to do. These are things that, again, <coughs> you make it through this and you keep your head on your shoulders and you be good and successful and still remember the virtuous reasons for doing what you're doing. These are the kind of people that we will need in this kind of organization. These are the, the, the successful ones that can be counted on to be a warrior in the battles to come. Now, the dilemma the peace officers face today is wrongful orders issued by a rogue government. The infiltration of the national government into local police power is nothing short of a criminal matter. Constitutionally, police power is a matter strictly reserved to the states, but increasingly since the 1960s, through a plethora of, agent, of agendas and tactics, the central government in D.C. has spread its tentacles deep into the web of the criminal justice system. This has been accomplished through court decisions, unlawful congressional acts, executive orders, task forces, the bureaucratic creation of local, or excuse me, of federal police agencies such as the BATF, the FBI, the CIA, the DOJ, and the critically misnamed Department of Justice. And we've also witnessed the increased militarization of local police powers. Our sheriff has a tank. <laughs> He's had a tank now for eight years, I think two tanks. Because you never know, we need a spare tank. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this, eight years and he's actually used it. He's actually, every, every year we see it trotting up for the uh, Christmas parade. <laughs> I hope that's all it's ever used for, is a Christmas parade. What a despondent situation we find ourselves in, Southern men and women when the very institutions that we grant extraordinary powers in an, effect, in an effort to serve us are abused and misused by a manipulating national government that seeks to make a tool out of local police that can be used to destroy us when the time comes. It should be alarming to us the massive unlawful acts that can and will be used by the regime in event of what they call a national emergency, such events are occurring with more and more frequency. As we all saw in April, martial law came to Boston. Now as I was watching that, and I was sitting there thinking, how would this go over in a southern town? Door to door, SWAT teams, warrantless searches, bringing them out with their hands on their heads, ordering them out, coming in their home. Uh, I don't like their chances on that still here. We got, we've got a long way to go, but I don't like that, that their chances on that really. Usually it's subtlety. One of the most, maybe the most effective means that they've got those tentacles wrapped into local police power is through the use of grants. It's gonna be hard to find a police agency anywhere in the South that doesn't put forth a great effort in obtaining these so-called grants. And these began to flood the market after 9-11. Because they're always here to help. Right? That's the nation. We're here to help you. Uh, these are forms of, that, of national blackmail. Cash-strapped police agencies are showered with federal money in the form of grants. And they apply for them and happily use them. Of course, the problem is these grants 
always come with strings attached. The agencies are duped into jumping through the hoops mandated by the issuer. Then like a mouse in a trap, there is no escape from this. And many times, especially odious, is when these grants require certain statistics to satisfy their issuance, they're again turning would-be peacekeepers into unnecessary law enforcers who prey upon their own people in order to feed the beast. It has become a sad, sad case. So how do we fix this? Simply put, we cannot, at least not in this system. We have erroneous court decision based on erroneous court decision based on erroneous court decision, based on erroneous precedent. You can't fix this. When I was younger and studied, uh, I do a lot of study on the Thomas Jefferson, and I remember his idea that the government is for the living, and that every generation or so we ought to just scrap everything and start back over. And I thought, that seems so odd, that's bizarre. Um, it makes more and more sense to me. Every year, we got to scrap this, We've got to scrap this and start over. Uh, reform is certainly not possible. We've got to return good uh, power to the people by making education, agriculture, economy, infrastructure, and yes, police power, local matters. That cannot happen in our current system. It took it years for it to devolve into the mess it is now. It is broken beyond repair. Southerners must separate themselves from it. It is imperative. Secession and independence is not only necessary to put police power back in its proper sphere, it's necessary for the well-being of all Southerners in regards to every aspect of a civil and truly federal form of government. I didn't just add this next part, by the way, Wayne, but Wayne Brown is here. He's a lieutenant at Aniston Police Department. He accompanied me to a meeting in Coleman, and on the way there asked me, he said, what is, what is the magic bean, as he put it, that would arouse our people to see exactly what was happening to them and how necessary the step of secession is? And I told him I considered that not only a good question, but perhaps the million dollar one. What will it take? We see all this, and we still see zombies walking around and accepting it. What's it going, what, what, what would it take? Um, Jody talks about, he asks people that he works with now, where's your line in the sand? And it's truly frightening how far back that line can be. People are just happy, the beer, ball games, and bass boats crowd. They get to go home, close themselves off from the world, doesn't affect me. I just want to, just want to live my life, just want to be happy. There is hope. Things like this deal with Sandy Hook happened and Obama comes out with these kind of proposals, it finally begins to wake some people up. Now they'll go back to sleep, but one day hopefully they will stay awake and they'll wake some of these people up and they realize they're gonna to have to make a choice. There may come a time when local peace officers have to make a choice between following an unlawful order and protecting their own people. Many are using this situation to begin to question exactly what kind of oppressive government would put them into such a position in the first place. The system does a fine job of overreach and implosion. We can only hope for much more of the same and the sooner the better. Now again, we didn't get here overnight. There are several problems and areas of great concern within what police power has become, but we must understand the crux of the problem and not blindly and wrongly assigned blame. Our enemies are not the cops. Have peace officers been used? Have they been confused about their role? Many of them have. By and large, our lawmen of Southern justice are good people with good intentions. They are just as susceptible to being swayed to our side and our views as any other Southerner, and I would say even more so. We add a good and successful peace officer or police agency also provides many good programs and benefits to their local community. For example, we do a civilian police academy every year. We do a junior police academy. We offer physical training to the citizens 
We do cases of constitutional law. I love to teach that one. Community watches, self-defense, marksmanship classes. We are, again, we have to understand that we are the servants of the people. We have to offer those things. Now, if we enter, if we see our dream of independence, of course, we won't enter into any kind of utopia. A new southern republic will not be free of evil. No human civilization ever will be. There will still be a need for civil government to protect liberties and counter threats to the commonwealth. And with that, we still need a criminal justice system and peace officers to act on our behalf and provide requisite services. So keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Keep them in your forefront of your efforts to cultivate and recruit people to the League of the South. And remember the words from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacekeepers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, at the beginning I said, among many reasons of why I do what I do, there's three main reasons. One of the reasons my wife April brought here today, the three main reasons for me doing what I do is Tyler and Nathaniel Jefferson and Shiloh Elizabeth. Our children are going to have to live in this mess that we're going, that they're going to grow up in that, this mess that we leave them with, and our children's children. And I hope that one day that I'm able to tell them I didn't just go home with my beer and my ball games and my bass boats. God save the South. I'll tell you. There will probably be time for questions and answers, but if anybody has questions, answers, comments, yes, sir. What do you think about the uh, Oath Keepers movement? Say that again. Oath, Oath Keeper. A little bit familiar with them. I uh, did some of them research on them there. It sounds like a pretty positive thing. It sounds very sim something similar to the county project sheriff that uh, or county sheriff project that I was talking about earlier. Uh, what do you think? I'm very much in favor of it, and we need it. He's talking about, for those that can't hear, he's talking about the Oath Keepers. You've heard of those in this group of um, mostly peace officers. I think there might be some military, ex-military in there as well who have taken an oath not to carry out unlawful orders issued by them. Actually, the oath is to maintain our oath and to, to uphold the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a very important movement, especially among Southerners who we have a lot of folks in the military and in law enforcement. And, uh, it's a grassroots movement designed to uh, make sure that we all remember what, what, what it was that we took and what it means, especially based on this government. And there are parallels drawn between peace officers, civilian peace officers, which what which I am, and, and military. It, it, that's a tough nut to crack too. We talk a lot about this, uh, Caleb Horton and I was talking about it last night, how tough that is to crack. I think one can still be a local peace officer and, and take your oath and carry it out and be a Southern nationalist. I don't believe that about the military anymore. I believe that they're following, they're carrying out measures from an immoral and corrupt commander in chief of whatever party and they, you can't just continue to justify being the good soldier anymore and carrying those out. I know we got a lot of ex-military in here, I, but, but most of what I've read from some ex-military have said that same thing before. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, are you familiar with uh, Arizona Sheriff Mack, who was arrested by the feds, taken to court, and he wanted to be the Yes, sir. And he's had quite a lot of success and resistance over, the, over his years of service. Yes, sir. you have any idea of uh, sure. how many peace officers are uh, members of the league? I do not. Um, and <laughs> I would say that most of you that seen me around here probably didn't even know that. The cat's out of the bag now, but uh, when, when Dr. Hill first asked me to speak, I was like, yes. Uh, and then he's, when he told me, I want you to speak about cultivating peace officers, I thought, 
thought, oh, uh, not used to wearing my bulletproof vest off, did he? Uh, <laughs> how, old, how big is that podium? Because I've, I've read and heard what many of you have said, okay? Uh, I would much rather have the red meat speech, you know, to throw the red meat to the wolves like some of these that Dr. Hill has. We just want to storm out of here and kill the first Yankee we come to, right? This can, this can be a hard sell for some of you. I don't know. Uh, I like to keep it low-key because the officious people that they just seem to be in love with themselves about it and uh, you know they get they're the ones that go to the grocery store and have the I'm the cop shirt you know <laughs> that that's not me and uh, plus I want to keep I want to hear what you really think so I don't know uh, I have no idea yes sir in the back I feel I do. Uh, now the county sheriff is up for grabs. He's bought and sold. Uh, we we need to get him out of there. He said he's likely to do anything. I do not have confidence in him if such a scenario came. But I do have a pretty good feel. Let, let me put it to you like this. Um, I went through that internal investigation and was cleared. The department I work at has been very supportive about that. They're not all on board now, but they've been very supportive. They're just, they're like other Southerners. They're, they have that fear of taking this step. What's it gonna do to me? What's it gonna do to my job? How, how's it gonna, you know, are they gonna start egging my house? It, it's the same thing. They're, they're Southerners just like others. But I'll, I'll tell you this, it starts every everybody every year something starts swirling back around about it you know that this guy works at the police department founder of a local hate group um, and i went in and told the chief last year i said because uh, i had a promotional interview and i thought for sure this was going to be brought back up again and it wasn't and i went back in there and, and i said is there anything that you want to ask me i said i promise you that whatever i do I'll, i'm going to exercise good judgment about it i'm not going to sell out my position with a league, that's something I believe in strongly. If it came down to it, I'd choose the league. And he's, I said, is there anything you want to ask me? He said, you just answered every question I have. And he even said this, he said, we pretty much think like you do. Huh. Uh, they're just, they're, they're like everybody else you come into contact with that's not here today. They're just not quite ready to take that step. But like I said earlier, they are much closer than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Yes. Do you think about the situation, the chances are that the sheriff in Arizona, the, the I don't get a good feel about Arizona politics now. They're, like I said earlier, the, the regime is, is capable of overreaching and implosion. It's going to be, when it comes down to an ultimate showdown, it's it. Some of these guys that write the letters, you know, who knows? It's easy to write a letter, right? And they're, they're holding it at the press conference. Sounds great. Does show, though, that they, if they've got a pulse on their constituency, it shows that what their constituents think. And that's what they want to hear, which is a good sign. Uh, again, we can't, we can't ultimately let the enemy be the arbiter of the decision. We, and I think too many Southerners still want to play that game and lawmen included. This sheriff in Arizona, I don't, I, I don't know enough about what he said to, to know what he would do in such a situation. Yes, sir. Yeah. What, what do you know about all this man's admission that will have security to I hear that. I hear that. Um, they, they keep that stuff away from us too. You know, they, they don't, uh, that stuff's pretty secret, but I, I hear probably exactly what you're hearing, and that is the pipeline's drying up, it's harder for even us to get ammunition. I've had some that I ordered four months ago through the department still don't have. There seems to be um, much less available to the citizens, and I've heard the same things that you're talking about, is that the Department of Homeland Security is buying it up and storing it like crazy. Make of that what you will. Mr. Pruitt. Thank you. Jo Josh, uh, earlier, well, just at the end of last month, I had the privilege of addressing that group, that uh, Sheriff Max group that uh, the gentleman mentioned, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, and they met out in uh, 
St. George's, near St. Louis, Missouri. <clears throat> and it was a, uh, a group of almost 300 people there, uh, and, and uh, I don't know how many actually were sheriffs. I'm gonna guess maybe there were 70, 75 sheriffs or police officers there. Um, the theme, uh, if I could just capsulize it in a, in a, in a sentence, was uh, when you, when you uh, talk about a peace officer, when you refuse to enforce an unconstitutional act, you're not disobeying the law, you're upholding the law. And that was, uh, that was repeated by a, a number of folks. And um, I, I wondered, I wondered uh, I was gonna ask you the same question, if, if you're familiar with that group and if you would uh, um, share that same, that same understanding. I'm not familiar with that group, but I absolutely, that goes right along with what you were talking about. We, take, we took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, which we, is antiquated and quite a quaint idea now, but also the Constitution of the state of Alabama. And if you take your oath seriously, you cannot enforce an unlawful order. Cannot do it. I have a comment and question also. I don't know how many people heard, but in Florida, the Liberty County Sheriff, um, has anybody heard about this? Yes. Well, what happened is there was a deputy that arrested this, one of the citizens for having a concealed weapon without a permit. I did hear about And he sheriff. went down and he took him out of jail. Yeah. And so what our great governor did is he had that sheriff had arrested. Had the sheriff arrested for it. Yep, for it. So, you know, just because, you know, so it's not just a, it's not just the sheriffs, you know, or governors have a little oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, those governors go to those same uh, governors' conferences in Washington and all that. When these people, I can't. I'm not saying this about every organization, but too many of these organizations, like the Alabama Sheriffs Association, they go and meet up. And you know what their main focus is? Get money. Trying to get money. Trying to get money, but main, even more so than that, get reelected, yeah. maintain power. That's what it's about. That's what they're taught. That's what they focus on. Well, my my question was. I'm sure just like everybody in here, if I'm driving down the road and I see a police officer or a law enforcement officer behind me, I get this nice warm feeling going and I'm protected. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden I see the lights come on and suppose it's not someone who who, who feels the same way that they're, they don't believe they're police officers but law enforcement officers. I mean, you see so much stuff on TV, uh, not TV, YouTube and all these type of things. What's the best way to deal with someone who's, you know, hey, you gotta do what I, I mean, I've had, uh, some deputies come, they probably call the sheriff, and I mean, the, their sergeant, and their sergeant told me personally, it doesn't matter what the law says, you have to do it because I said so. I mean, so when you have people like that, what's the, what's your, when you're having the kind of, what's the best way to handle that where you don't get yourself shot or, you know? Oh yeah, well, you have due process. Um, even on a traffic citation, if you, if you have the inclination and the time and the wherewithal to go to court on it, that would be the time to argue it, and I, I would in that situation. I hear, I've heard these same stories. I'm just as appalled as you are. I think those are in the, the minority of occurrences, but it's, when you're dealing with issues of liberty, it's more important than a uh, slip up of a cash register person. I'm not giving the correct change. It's a much more bigger deal. Um, be careful about the YouTube videos. All right, some people, the, a lot of people that post on there have an agenda, and you can't take an extract out of a, uh, a, a video on YouTube without broader context. Let me give you one from, from, from Aniston, okay? There's a YouTube video going around. I'm trying to remember what you have to Google to get to it, but it's something like cop, uh, something to do with open carry. We are an open carry state. The, the video clip starts off, a guy is in his yard and has a gun strapped on his holster. All of a sudden you see an Aniston police officer come and start talking to him harshly and uh, then he, the police officer pulls his gun and puts it to the guy's face and then winds up arresting him, okay? Looks horrible. What you don't know is before this camera started rolling, there was a police pursuit on the roadway Officers had responded to a call of uh, illegal four-wheelers riding on the roadway. The, the man is on an illegal four-wheeler. He doesn't stop. He's, he's strapped on on the four-wheeler, uh, eludes the officer, goes to his yard where I guess it's like a hide-and-go-seek. I'll get to my house and I'm, I'm free, right? Um, so then the officer then pursues him into his yard, 
the guy goes for his weapon, which you can't see on the weapon on, the, on that from that angle of the film either. You can see it on the police officer's scorpion video. So of course he pulls his weapon. So I want to say all that to say just be careful because some of those things people are framing an incident. Your question, I, that's what I would do if if I was in a situation where I thought I was actually wrong. <coughs> I'd take it to court and I'd appeal it if I needed to because the more publicity that somebody does that, that some some lawmen that are acting that way think that they can act like they want to at a stop and it's never going to go anywhere but right there. So the more light that shines on these things, the better for all of us. I don't want to take up too much time. So, Jody? One comment would, one thing I don't want to fail to take away from this is that. Uh, Regardless of all the examples or anything, whether it's deserved or not, is uh, the importance here and what to take away is cultivating a relationship with your police officers and cultivating the community with them and not being at odds with them to the point where they are, it's not an us versus them society. They, they, they have the understanding that they are serving you and you look for opportunities. Hmm. Yeah, we're, I'm, I, I said it earlier too, some of them are just as in need of persuasion as our other fellow Southerners. I see the error of the way. Yes, sir. Uh, Sarah and I, a couple of years, I guess maybe a year and a half ago, went to the Florence Police Department and, and uh, took some of the courses that they've offered on uh, shooting, marksmanship, and things such as that, mainly because. I bought her a, a Glock 9mm and she wanted some official training with it, so we, we did that. And some of the guys that uh, I've gotten to know very well at the Florence Police Department are on the local SWAT team. And I've had a chance to talk to them. Those guys are on our side. And that's one reason I wanted you to come here today with the appeal for us not to overlook the great majority, I think, of local law enforcement and peace officers who are amenable to listening to our message. Now, I know it's easy to, to look out and see what's going on with the YouTube videos and all the horror stories, but I come from a, a family of peace officers, and I'm as harsh on the ones who don't do what they're supposed to as anybody. Because that's such a trust has been given to the officers that when they violate it, it's worse than somebody who does not have that trust. And they should be held to a higher standard. But at the same time, we don't need to throw the proverbial baby out of the bathwater. Because a lot of these are good Southern men who are, who are very receptive to the ideas of liberty freedom and even southern nationalism. And I've seen it with my local police department. And we have cultivated some very, very good times with these people that I think if and when the time comes that we will need their support, they will be there to get it. And uh, I think they're very sincere in what they say and uh, I think we all ought to uh, try to cultivate these relationships with our local peace officers, whether they're policemen or sheriffs or deputies or whatever, because there will come a time when we need them. And I've studied enough of these movements. These are the kinds of people that you want on your side. Mm -hmm. I think I heard Michael touch to it this way, that if we see corruption out there, we ought to call it what it is and root the people out, regardless of what field they're in. Uh, same thing with, with police, um, but there's you know there's corruption everywhere. Unfortunately, there's corruption in the fire department. But if my house catches on fire, I'm probably gonna call them. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's corruption in churches, and I'm not gonna go to some of them, but I'm gonna find the church and I'm gonna go to church. Um, there's corruption in police power, but I'm not going to wage war on them every police department out there. Uh, there's plenty of them. Yes, sir. Uh, I 
think we do have at times more power than we realize. In Nashville, I was asked for order to serve on a grand jury, and in Nashville, they have two grand juries, one for regular cases, one for drunk drivers. We have so many trucks in Nashville. I guess they all want to be, want to be movie, uh, country music stars anyway. Uh, so the police officer presents the case, and then the grand jury votes on it, whether it's a no bill or a true bill. And most of them, our citizens, are, it's pretty obvious. You got your car backed up on a, a concrete block wall and spinning the wheels. I think he's probably drunk. Um, but one, a young lady was stopped in a roadblock. And they uh, asked her for a field sobriety test and so forth and so on. So I asked the officer, I said, what was the probable cause? And he said, well, uh, we noticed that she was speech was slurred and everything. I said, no, no. What was the probable cause for stopping her in the first place? He said, well, it was a, a sobriety checkpoint. It was a roadblock. And I said, well, that's not probable cause. And he says, well, no, Tennessee statute such and such, such and such says we can stop people. And it was legal. And I said, well, everything Hitler did was legal. That's right. And everything that Stalin did was legal. It doesn't mean it was right, but they claimed it was legal under Nazism and under communism. So I, you have to have two votes on a grand jury to throw it out. So I convinced another person to vote no, true bill on that, and they threw that case out. Needless to say, I've not been asked to serve on the <laughs> <laughs> The point is, if one or two people will stand up to say, and, and I don't, you know, maybe the, the lady was guilty of driving under the influence, but it was the way it was handled, stopping in a roadblock and presenting your papers to travel in the third right is not what we're about. So you do have a chance every once in a while to stand up to that. Uh, don't get past the Weaver's time, though. I'm looking forward to that. So, thank y'all.